Um, my part of the presentation, I'm looking to cover um, two main areas really in that we're going to look at what assets can be used um, in the payment of care home fees and also what steps can you take, if any, to mitigate the potential um, cost of residential care. So I suppose a good place to probably start is the facts. So in 2019 to 2020, the average cost of residential care in England was £681 per week and for nursing care that was £979 per week. Um, this gives you annual residential care costs of over £35,000 and annual nursing home costs of over £50,000. So you can see why um, a lot of our clients are uh, worried about this potential uh, liability and the impact that it may have on their estates and what they can ultimately pass on um, to their beneficiaries. So as the webinar, we're hoping um, it's going to take a, a, an hour um, overall. I've not got that long, so it's not going to be um, a, a full cover of everything to do with care, care funding. So just to um, reiterate, um, fortunately, I will be able to cover um, about non-residential care funding, which is care that you receive at home, the rules relating to temporary respite or COVID care funding um, and third party top ups. Um, and also, unfortunately, what we're not going to touch upon are the proposed reforms to adult social care, which includes this proposed cap on care costs. Um, I presume many of you see, have seen it in the news over the last uh, few weeks, um, but that isn't um, quite finalised yet um, and won't be coming into force until 2023. Um, but what that does aim to do is, is to put a, a cap on costs for care uh, of around eight to six thousand pounds and potentially raise uh, the limit at which you start paying from your capital. Uh, but I think what's probably best is if we revisit that um, issue at a later date. Uh, um, and we can look at the impacts that they may that may have on any assessments. So uh, what I will say is this presentation is aimed to give a brief overview of how funding for permanent residential care works. But we would recommend that you contact us to obtain specialist legal advice regarding your individual circumstances um, if you or a loved one that is facing uh, possible care. So who pays if you go into permanent residential care? Um, there are three main possibilities. It could be you, privately funded, it could be the local authority, subject to financial assessment, or it could be the NHS. Now the NHS is going to be covered by our next speaker, so I'm not going to say anything on that. Um, so when we're looking at you as the individual, so you do not have to have a local authority financial assessment if you end up in permanent residential care. You could go out and choose the care home that you want to move into, you could pick the room and you can, um, privately contract with that care home for providing that service. The main advantage of that is obviously the choice that you would have, um, the fact that you would be in control and the fact that you wouldn't need to disclose um, details of your assets or income to anyone. You would simply be paying for a service. Obviously the biggest disadvantage of that is that you're going to pay. Um, potentially you might even end up paying more for, for that um, care because the local authorities uh, can sometimes get lower contracted rates for rooms uh, than a, a private individual. So the other alternative is the local authority. If you need residential care, the local authority may have a duty to arrange it once they've assessed your needs. You are likely to have to pay something towards the fees for such care from your income and your capital. If the local authority is involved in arranging your care, the amount you will pay is worked out via a financial assessment. So when we're talking about the financial assessment, what they're looking at is um, the starting point is your capital. If you have capital worth over £23,250, you must pay the full cost of your care. This is known as being a self-funder. If you have less than £14,250 of um, capital, you would contribute from your income, but not from your capital. If you have between 14,250 and 23,250, you must contribute from your income and then also a tariff income. You are treated as having a one pound extra per week of income for every 250 pounds you have over and above the 14,250. Uh, so for example, if you have an annual income of 15,000 pounds, that's 750 pounds more than the lower limit, you'll be treated as having an extra three pounds per week, which you must use towards the cost of your care. 
So when we're talking about capital, what do we mean? So the definition of capital will um, include solely owned assets, uh, such as banks or building society accounts, and that means all sorts of accounts held with them, so current savings accounts and ICEs. It would include um, investments in stocks and shares. It would include national savings and investment products, such as premium bonds and income bonds, and also any investment properties that you own or second homes. There are a few um, capital assets that might be partially or fully disregarded, um, but it's quite a specialised area. The main ones um, that are disregarded is the potential surrender value of life insurance policies. And then there can be certain types of investment bonds with life assurance um, elements that are disregarded. But again, like I say, it is it's a specialised area. So it's probably best to speak to a financial advisor about the type of assets that you're holding and whether they might um, qualify for, for a disregard. Uh, also, the contents of a personal injury trust would not be um, assessed for the purposes of capital for care home fees. Now, in respect of any jointly owned assets, um, what happens is that the value of those assets would be divided equally unless evidence shows that your share is unequal. So in the case of a married couple, if you had a savings account um, with £20,000 in and one of you ends up in care, you would be classed as owning £10,000 from that account for the purposes of the financial assessment. Now, um, probably the most important assets for most clients is uh, the home. The home can be included in the, cap in the definition of capital in certain circumstances. Your interest in your existing main or only home is usually taken into account. However, the value should be disregarded if any of the following continue to live in the property. Your spouse, partner or civil partner, a lone parent who is your estranged or divorced partner, a relative of yours or member of your family who is aged over 60, or a child of yours who is aged under 18, or someone who is incapacitated. So that's very important. Um, if you are one of a couple and you end up in residential care, as long as your spouse or partner remains living in the property, that value of the property would be wholly disregarded for the purposes of financial assessment. So it's basically as if the asset doesn't exist, the, the home doesn't exist when assessing your contribution towards the cost of your care. Now, the concern with that is that you would need to consider how the property would pass if the person who is in actual occupation of the home dies before the person that's in care. Now, for the majority of married couples, um, their wills would be set out so that the whole estate passes to the surviving spouse. In those circumstances, what that would mean is that the, the spouse that is in care would inherit the whole of the value of the property that would then count towards the, the um, capital uh, calculation for the purposes of the care home fees. Uh, so that could have a significant impact. Um, so what we would highlight in those circumstances is the impact of updating and potentially changing the terms of your will, which I'll address um, a bit later on. Um, the local authority also has the discretion to disregard the value of the property if somebody lives in it but doesn't qualify for one of these mandatory disregards. That would be done on a case by case basis, but basically you can't just move in in the uh, hope of protecting um, a family uh, loved one's property from being used. So that's capital and property. In terms of income, most types of your income would be taken into consideration, which would include private pensions, any income from investments and state benefits. Um, again, there are a number of disregarded types of income, but again, it's, it's quite limited. So in respect of disability living allowance or personal independence payments, the mobility component of those benefits are disregarded for the purposes of the income assessment. Um, the very generous £10 state pension Christmas bonus is also excluded and any child tax credits or guardians allowances are excluded. Um, but apart from that, the, the majority of income would be taken into account. When adding all of your income 
um, together, what the local authority must then do is allow you to keep a personal expenses allowance of at least £24.90 per week. So around £100 of your income per month would be disregarded from um, your income calculation. Uh, so that would be exempt from being used uh, towards the cost of your care. Now, when faced with that information that most of your capital and most, if not all of your income would be taken into account for the payment of care fees, um, I'm quite often faced with the statement that a client is just going to give their house away or sell it to their daughter for a pound um, and then it can't be used. Unfortunately, um, that's not the case. So what's um, important to explain here is uh, the notion of, of deprivation of uh, assets. Deprivation is when assets or income are given away, disposed of or not claimed with the intention of reducing the amount of you must pay towards your care fees. If this happens, the local authority has the power to treat you as though you still possess the asset you've given away as notional capital or income in the financial assessment. So they will treat you as if you still have that asset or that income. Now, in respect of these um, instances, what the local authority are going to consider is motivation and timing. What they must do is um, with any transaction that they're seeking to challenge, they must show that you um, knew that you needed care and support in the future um, when you, you took out this action. Uh, it is therefore an evidence-based test of both foreseeability and intention. And again, I think something that is often uh, misunderstood is the time frame uh, under which the local authority can potentially look at transactions. Um, there is no time limit um, where the local authority can investigate. If something was done with the sole motivation of um, depriving yourself of an asset for care fees purposes, that, that, that could always be challenged no matter how long um, elapses between the transfer of the asset and the actual requirement for care. Um, I often see quoted, as long as it's more than seven years ago, that that works, that that's not the case. Um, the seven year rule relates to um, inheritance tax and uh, the gifts under the inheritance, uh, for inheritance tax purposes, it, it's not applicable here. Um, so whilst the, I've said that you can't do something um, with the motivation of, of depriving yourself of assets if it's done with the motivation of avoiding paying care fees or limiting what's available. Um, there are obviously instances where clients uh, legitimately dispose of assets as part of tax planning opportunities um, or just on the basis of them wanting to make gifts. Uh, a significant amount of clients look to gift um, deposits for properties for adult children um, and there's nothing stopping you undertaking those types of transactions um, but we just have to consider uh, the impact of, of um, motivation and timing. The guidance for the local authority uh, in fact states that people should be treated with dignity and respect and be able to spend the money they have saved as they wish. It is their money after all but it is important that people pay their contribution to their care costs that they are responsible for. This is key to the overall affordability of the care and support system. A local authority should therefore ensure that people are not rewarded for trying to avoid paying their assessed contribution. So that is what they're really considering. So the two points of that are the intention. If you intend to avoid the care charge, it must be a significant factor or the only reason that you've transferred the asset elsewhere. Um, and further, the guidance states that it is actually unreasonable to decide you have disposed of an asset to reduce the level of care charges payable if at the time of the disposal you were fit and healthy and could not have foreseen a need for care and support. Um, so if you're fit and healthy and have no other um, conditions or diagnosis that might lead you to believe that you may require care in the future, it is going to be very difficult for a local authority to challenge any transactions done at that time um, uh, as a deprivation. Um, but similarly, if you 
are elderly or in ill health or had some sort of diagnosis that may make care more likely, anything that is done um, that minimises your assets that are available for potential future care could be challenged. Because of the nature of that, that it's evidence-based um, and based on motivation and timing, uh, it's very unpredictable, the consequences of any transaction. So it's very hard for us as solicitors to give um, advice to say how a particular transaction might or would be viewed. It would simply be at the time of the assessment um, that the local authority could look into any matters. So I think that's important uh, to understand. Um, so now that I've depressed you all with the complete the potential cost of care, um, I've told you all of your capitals and you know, most of your income is going to be taken into account. And I've told you that you can't just simply uh, transfer everything away. What can you do? So what we view as um, the options available to you to mitigate the risk of potential care costs um, are to put in place uh, efficient legal documentation um, to assist. So uh, we would obviously always recommend a will for anybody uh, to ensure that your assets pass in accordance with your wishes. But in this context, the um, points to consider are uh, reviewing and considering who you're appointing as your executors. Again, as I referred to earlier, uh, most married couples or unmarried couples would appoint each other as the sole executor and sole beneficiary of their estate. Um, you may wish to consider appointing your spouse or partner together with potential adult children um, or other potential beneficiaries to ensure that you are always going to have somebody that is capable of dealing with the administration of your estate. Then um, whilst I've spoken about the fact that the local authority um, can challenge actions that you've undertaken as an individual um, and that you um, cannot actively minimise your estate for the purposes of care. What you could consider as part of a couple is whether in fact it is the most sensible decision to transfer all of the assets um, to the survivor on the death of either one of you. If you have significant assets in terms of savings, um, if you each own a significant sum, would your spouse need your savings if something happened to them um, or could they uh, you know live comfortably on, on what they have in their own name or are there ways to um, organize your estates so that the spouse has sufficient assets uh, but not excessive um, assets passing to them uh, in the event of the death of either one of you so what you could look to do when you will is to make immediate gifts to children or grandchildren or other potential beneficiaries um, other than your spouse. Then what I mentioned earlier in respect of the property um, is also what we would consider in terms of looking at your will. Again, most married couples um, or unmarried couples will look to transfer the whole of the property to the surviving partner on the death of either one of them. What you could look to do is to um, instead, on the first death, create a trust which allows the surviving um, spouse or partner to continue to live in the property and to benefit from the deceased partner's 50% share, but um, ultimately pass to other beneficiaries. So what that means is that the surviving spouse would live in the property, they would be protected in that it would be set out that they couldn't be charged rent to live in the property, and nobody is to interfere with their occupation of the property. They are still um, responsible for all the ongoing costs of living in the property as if they were the absolute owner. But what the trust would state is that if that um, spouse should end, in, end up in care themselves, that the interest in that 50% share of the property terminates and the 50% share of the deceased spouse can pass to other beneficiaries such as children or grandchildren. Um, so that is a really important um, consideration and, and option uh, 
for those of you looking to take some steps um, towards protection um, of assets and we'd be happy to discuss that with you in, in further detail if you want to come in um, for an appointment with us. Now the other legal documentation that we would recommend to put in place to mitigate um, the risks of, of residential care are documents called lasting powers of attorney. Lasting powers of attorney are um, documents which allow an individual to appoint a person or people of their choice to make decisions on their behalf if they become incapable of making decisions themselves. There are two types of powers of attorney, one that covers decisions about property and financial affairs, and one that covers decisions about health and welfare. The property and financial affairs power of attorney can be used um, if you ask for assistance, um, but still retain capacity, or at a point where you lack capacity to make decisions about property and finance yourself. In um, relation to what we're talking about today, the possibility of you ending up in residential care by the importance of putting a financial power of attorney in place means that the people that you appoint would have immediate access to your finances and be able to take immediate steps to mitigate um, against the, the financial impact of the residential care that you're receiving. Uh, so what that means in, in sort of real life examples is that if you are a single person living in a, a property in which you own and you end up in residential care, um, you may well be assessed as paying the full, needing to pay the full cost of your care, rather than just selling um, the property and putting it in a bank account to pay the care fees. If you have attorneys in place, what it means is they could consider options uh, such as renting out your property to produce an income, which could then be used uh, to offset the cost of, of the care fees. Um, also, it allows attorneys to, to seek immediate financial advice about other um, options that can be available to them um, and just make sure that there's somebody in place uh, to act on your behalf and, and to undertake the, the financial assessment should you require um, care in the future. So the final document is the health and welfare lasting power of attorney. Um, that one only ever comes into effect if you are incapable of making uh, decisions about your own health and welfare. Um, and what that allows is for the person that you've appointed to effectively step into your shoes and make the decision on your behalf. So that could be important um, to ensure decisions about medical treatment um, are taken in a way that you want them to be taken and also decisions about your health and, and your care um, uh, are, are listened to and that your attorneys um, can make sure that your, your wishes are taken into account um, when discussing uh, care options. Um, so those are the documents that we think are really important and the, the ways that you can um, effectively plan for your future. Um, and I think that brings me nicely to the end. Um, so I'm hoping that I didn't whiz through that too quickly. Um, if there are any questions, I'm going to stop sharing my presentation. And then I think, Taryn, have we had any questions in or? Hi Leah, thank you very much um, for your presentation. We don't have any questions at the moment. I'll give it a, okay. just a minute if anyone's got anything they want to send across. Um, equally, we are going to have another Q&A after Stephanie's presentation. So if we do have any outstanding questions or you think of anything later, and you can answer it at the end um, and ask Leah. Alternatively, as Leah mentioned, you can always follow up with us after the webinar as well. We will send out an email with everyone's contact details on if you do think of anything you'd like to follow up later on. Not got anything coming through. Leah, you might have answered everyone's questions. Oh, in your absolutely, that, that must be it. <laughs> Not that everybody's too shy to ask anything. <laughs> Yep, so that's absolutely fine. I think, shall we get Stephanie on? And we'll pass over to you, Steph. Lovely, thanks for that, Leah, really interesting. Um, hope people got a lot from it. Um, I'm just bringing up um, one of my screens. Hope.
Okay, so my name is uh, Stephanie Ford. I'm one of the directors at Care Necessities, um, and I'm also a care fee funding advocate. Um, today, I'm going to try and give you a brief overview with regards to NHS continuing healthcare funding. Uh, given your decision to attend this webinar today, it's most likely that um, you know someone who is either in receipt of care or is likely to require care in the not too distant future. This can be very upsetting and a very challenging time for families. Um, they can be very concerned about their loved ones, but there might be an urgency involved and they can feel very overwhelmed during these times. So we get approached by a lot of people who are in those circumstances. In these particular circumstances, a family might look for assistance from social services or from the NHS in the hope that someone will be able to guide them through the process. But unfortunately, as we all know, particularly at the present time, local authorities and the NHS are very underfunded and they have limited resource resources available to them. In the circumstances, they might not be able to give you the help and support that families would like or need at those particular times. And also mistakes can happen during the care funding process. So it's really important for families not only to know the basics about care fee funding, but also to recognise when something appears to have gone wrong so that they know what they can actually do to try and remedy the situation. So obviously counting the cost of care is very important. If I refer you back to Leah's original presentation, you'll recall that the average annual fees for residential care exceed £35,000 per year and nursing care almost equates to £51,000 per year. Obviously, care fees will vary regionally, um, especially with the added complication of COVID. But in our experience, four weekly fees of £5,000 aren't uncommon, um, which would calculate to approximately £65,000 per year. If you need or would you like or you would like full time living carers, then obviously those fees can quickly escalate. Um, and we have some clients that pay nearer to £130,000 per year. If you need a more specialist care package, the fees can be even higher than that. I have recently been involved in a case where the local authority wanted to move a client to a different care home in view of the complexity of her needs and the cost of that care home actually equated to four and a half thousand pounds per week. So obviously, if she'd have paid that over the year, that would have been two hundred and thirty thousand pounds that year she would have paid in care fees. The figures are quite staggering, irrespective as to whether or not you're paying forty thousand pounds or even if you are paying two hundred thousand pounds per year. And there's little wonder why families feel that there is no option other than to sell their loved ones home to pay for their bills. So having depressed you even further from Leah's presentation uh, with regards to the financial implications of long term care fees, it's reasonable to ask whether there might be a solution. Many individuals are now seeking financial and legal advice to help them plan ahead. And as Leah has already mentioned with us today, one potential solution is NHS continuing healthcare funding, which is often referred to as NHS CHC for short. You might not have heard about it and you wouldn't be alone because unfortunately it's commonly known as the NHS's best kept secret. Um, a very high percentage of clients who call us asking for help comment on the fact that they've never even heard about it, which is quite concerning. There is information out there, but you unfortunately have to know where to look and what you're looking for. And access to the Internet can therefore be invaluable. For those individuals who don't have a good support network, they are likely to find it an extremely daunting and lonely place to be, never being certain that the information that they have found in the first place might actually be correct, because unfortunately, Google doesn't always tell us everything. So if we look firstly at what NHS continuing healthcare actually is. So put simply, if an individual who is receiving care, either at home or in a care home environment, is determined to have a primary healthcare need, they will no longer be responsible for any of their care fees. Importantly, the right to NHS continuing healthcare is not subjected to means testing and therefore can be awarded irrespective of capital or income. It is purely based on an individual's care needs. If eligibility is agreed, care fees will be paid directly by the NHS. So given the costs of care that we've already talked about and the financial consequences of having to pay for your care privately, it's not unreasonable to assume that the assessment process would be a comprehensive one. 
But sadly, in our experience, this is unfortunately often not the case. As I touched on earlier, we all have to remember that the NHS is very underfunded and therefore it does not simply have the resources for nurse assessors to spend the amount of time on a case that they would like, especially in view of all the financial implications of private care fee funding. The current pandemic has only made the situation much worse because nurse assessors and social workers have then been unable to undertake their own personal assessments of the individuals concerned. And given the limitations upon families to visit loved ones at the present time in a normal care home setting, families are finding it really difficult to be able to contribute valuably to the assessment process. In the circumstances, assessments can rely heavily on the input of the care home representative and the quality of the record keeping at that particular care home. But again, time constraints mean that we've rarely come across a comprehensive set of records having been made. All of these problems together does unfortunately result in funding being wrongly denied or withdrawn and the financial implications as we've already mentioned can be quite catastrophic as a result of this. In the circumstances it is imperative that you are not only aware of what NHS continuing healthcare funding is but also that you are prepared for it. In many cases you might be advised that someone is going to undertake a care assessment um, and if you are not careful, you can find yourself in a meeting with numerous medical professionals who are there to determine eligibility and you can very much feel out of depth as to what is happening. So before we talk about the actual assessment process itself for CHC funding, I just wanted to touch upon the differences between what is social care need and what is a health related need, because this is essentially what it boils down to. The difference is important because in order to qualify for NHS continuing healthcare funding, an individual must have healthcare related needs. The distinction between the two elements is important, but is not unfortunately straightforward. To try and give you an example, a social care need might be an individual who needs help to bathe, dress and perhaps have their meals prepared for them. If, however, you have somebody who has problems in swallowing food, there might be a risk of them choking while they are eating, in which case it might be serious enough to be considered that of a health related need. It can unfortunately not be easy to establish whether someone's needs are social in nature or if they are health related. It is extremely subjective because there is no concise definition and there is, if there is any area of disagreement, assessors do tend to suggest that the need is more social as opposed to health related. But it isn't straightforward and it is due purely to this complexity that any assessment should be attended by what is called a multidisciplinary team or MDT for short. This will usually consist of a nurse assessor, also a social worker from the local authority and generally a representative from the care home. Before outlining the process itself, if I could refer you to the section that's highlighted on the screen in front of you, it is very important. In a lot of cases, families can be approached by a local authority at an early stage, requesting that a financial assessment be completed. Understandably, many people may simply complete the form and return it, but I would advise you to approach doing this with caution. A financial assessment will help the local authority to determine whether or not your loved one might qualify for financial help from them with regards to care fees if they are not deemed as being eligible for NHS continuing healthcare funding. If the local authority determines from the assessment that your loved one is not entitled to local authority financial assistance, you might find their interest in your case then wanes a little if they find out that you have got enough funds to pay for yourself. In the circumstances, I would simply suggest to the local authority that any financial assessment really should be put to one side until we can be certain that the NHS continuing healthcare assessment need not be completed, given that the local authority does have a fundamental duty in accordance with the Care Act to determine this before any financial discussions take place. With regards to the assessment process itself, when a patient is, for instance, discharged from hospital, placed in care, needs home care or has a change in their care needs, they should all have an NHS continuing healthcare checklist completed to establish their needs at that given time. 
The healthcare checklist is the screening tool that is used to determine the extent of a patient's needs and to determine whether or not they have any health related needs, which may warrant a full assessment by way of something called a decision support tool or DST. So this is the essentially the full assessment that would take place for NHS continuing healthcare funding. Once the checklist has been completed, if the social worker or nurse assessor believes that the individual's needs are such that he or she might be entitled to CHC funding, they will then screen that person into the next stage. If the social worker, however, feels that the individual's needs are social in nature, then they will be screened out of the process at that point in time. That would be when I would then expect it to be appropriate for a financial assessment to be completed thereafter. So if the individual screens out of the assessment process, the local authority will be responsible for the provision of care. However, the financial element of those care needs would then have to be paid for by the individual, as it would be calculated by way of means testing and also a financial assessment taking place. If, however, they have screened into the assessment process and the next stage, the social worker instead should not ask about any financial um, any available capital, sorry, they should instead request that a full assessment known as the decision support tool be undertaken. So as stated in the previous slide, CHC assessments are usually attended in person by an MDT, which usually consists of a nurse assessor from the NHS, a social worker and a representative from the care home. To demonstrate what is considered when a decision support tool assessment is undertaken, I've put on the screen in front of you the domains that they would usually look at. Deliberation would be given to these 12 care domains, as you can see on the screen. So we've got breathing, nutrition, continence, skin, mobility, communication, psychological and emotional needs, cognition, behaviour, drug therapies, altered states of consciousness and other. So anything else that doesn't fit within those box would be discussed at that point. So it's important to note that eligibility is not condition related. So you might say somebody's got dementia or a cancer diagnosis. It doesn't actually determine the eligibility alone. As stated earlier, it is all dependent upon the care needs that someone has as a result of those conditions. And they must be then essentially health related as opposed to social in nature. There is clearly a lot of information to be considered during an assessment and given what is at stake financially, you would hope that the nurse assessor would have undertaken a detailed and thorough assessment of that person's medical history, as well as undertaking a face to face assessment before the DST meeting is held. Unfortunately, however, as I indicated earlier, this cannot always be the case. Many assessors are allowed little time to review medical records and prepare for the assessment, again due to lack of resources and funding. And obviously at the present time due to the pandemic, most meetings are being held by video conference, so they might not have even had the ability to see the records before any assessment takes place. Given the earlier comments I made with regards to the quality of these assessments, historically, COVID restrictions have undoubtedly made this situation much worse. So the need for a detailed investigation and preparation with regards to NHS continuing healthcare funding is vital. This is demonstrated in the case of Mrs D. Mrs D was a lady who was living in a residential care home. Care necessities were instructed by her daughter, who was in fact a doctor. So to be approached by a doctor who can't get the funding herself speaks volumes, I think. Mrs D was in receipt of NHS continuing healthcare funding for some time, but she suddenly lost it two years ago. A new assessment was to be arranged and her daughter wanted us to prepare to attend that assessment with her. When we obtained the care home records to try and understand why funding had been revoked, the notes supported a lady who was wandering around the home and pacing. She was eating cake and she had a catheter in situ. Having met the lady, it actually transpired that she was totally immobile, so she couldn't walk or pace. She was on a liquidised diet, so she couldn't have eaten cake or she would have choked. And she was doubly incontinent, therefore there was no catheter in situ. At the previous NHS continuing healthcare assessment, she had been reviewed eligibility for several reasons, but the main one was that the nurse assessor stated that she ate cake on a regular basis. 
When considering the nutrition domain, she gave this lady a low level of need despite her being on a puree diet with thickened fluids. This was despite also the fact that she was having frequent chest infections and a problematic swallow, which should have essentially always given her the high level of need that she had already had at previous assessments. This clearly wasn't right, and it highlights the requirement to ensure not only that you understand the individual's health-related needs, but also that these needs are correctly documented within the care home records. Inadequate record keeping can be the cause of an individual not being awarded funding, so this does need to be reviewed before any assessment takes place. Unfortunately, the care home will not do this, and nor will the NHS assessor, who simply will refer to the written records as they are presented. In the case of Mrs D, we had to introduce bespoke care charts for the care home to complete before the NHS CHC assessment was due to take place again. But because we did that, we were then able to provide the evidence to the assessor in support of our case and funding was awarded on appeal and also moving forward. As stated, the 12 care domains to discuss during a full multidisciplinary team assessment are necessary and the assessor will usually be allowed approximately two hours for a full assessment to be undertaken. But unfortunately, our record to date was a total of seven hours for one of these assessments. So as you can appreciate, it is um, important that you are prepared for that assessment taking place. So securing funding is really not an easy process, and this is reflected in the graphs that you can see in front of you, which provides some statistics for NHS continuing healthcare funding over the last few years. The purple column represents how many people were assessed for NHS continuing healthcare funding, um, and this was over the last um, few years, so 2017 right through to 2019. And it also shows the green columns representing the applications where funding was actually agreed. So as you can see out of those assessed here, only an average of 26% of people are deemed as being eligible for NHS continuing healthcare funding. Noticeably, all the figures given here have reduced, namely the number of people being assessed, the percentage of people also being considered as eligible. The question arises, why if we are in an ageing population are the number of applications reducing instead of increasing? And why are the number of successful applications also declining? This graph actually shows more of what we are seeing on a regular basis. We actually believe that there are more people out there who have primary health needs, but assessors aren't completing comprehensive assessments. It is not uncommon for assessors to attend meetings with little or no background with regards to the individuals that they are assessing, and they sometimes fail to adhere to the correct process. They can also be reluctant to take on board input from relatives with regards to needs that their loved one has, and in some cases they can be extremely dismissive, which can often result in the meetings becoming very hostile and argumentative places to be. Sometimes assessors will try to control the assessment and the family or the attorney or deputy will soon realise that they are out of their depth. In our opinion, there is no wonder why the prospects of securing CHC eligibility are unfortunately as low as they are. So the data on the previous screen was obviously obtained historically before the coronavirus pandemic. And as the more recent statistics have now been released from the NHS, I thought I would also review the most recent data to see whether there have been any significant changes with regards to eligibility over the last quarter. As you can see, unfortunately, it remains on a par with the historical data in that only 25% of applications for funding are now proved to be um, successful. So what happens if funding is denied? Can you request another assessment being undertaken? If an NHS continuing healthcare checklist has been completed and you accept this assessment, then unfortunately the answer is no. The NHS will only undertake a new NHS continuing healthcare checklist if there has been a fundamental change in need. That may be the case if an individual's condition suddenly deteriorates or perhaps they have to be hospitalised, but otherwise you are then stuck with that decision until the next assessment is scheduled to take place, which may be a year or so down the line. And even then, if the needs remain the same, they may not be prepared to alter this decision. Is there anything that you can be done if your loved one or someone you are representing has a negative healthcare checklist? Well, actually, there is. You can lodge an appeal against the decision if you feel that it's the wrong outcome. 
And if you can provide a detailed submission explaining why the assessment was not correct, you can either include breaches of process and also a dis disagreement with regards to the scorings that were given within each of the domains. But again, it's very much interpretation based and it is at a discretion um, on a discretionary basis that they will overturn an NHS continuing healthcare checklist. So it's better to be prepared before that assessment take place if you are aware of it. Similarly, if a decision to port tool had been completed and the outcome was reached that the individual was not entitled to CHC funding, you can also appeal this decision. Every region is different, but in the majority of cases with the DST, the CCG will allow you six months from the date of that outcome in which to appeal that assessment. So by way of a quick recap on what I have gone over today, it is important to remember that the local authority may be unwilling to offer much assistance to individuals if they know that the person has sufficient capital to fund his or her own care fees. Given the lack of funding available to the NHS, coupled with inadequate resources, the assessment process for CHC eligibility might be declined incorrectly. If NHS CHC funding is awarded, it will save thousands of pounds in care fees. Attorneys and deputies have a fundamental duty to ensure that assets and capital are preserved wherever possible. In view of what we've discussed today, how many of you would actually be prepared to proceed with this process without having taken any advice? How many of you would be prepared to attend an assessment and feel confident that you could identify possible breaches of process and make additional submissions with regards to the 12 care domains to argue for funding for the person concerned? In view of what we now know, and given the financial implications for a client if funding is not awarded, I would imagine that the vast percentage of you would be extremely concerned about the eligibility process. So a significant number of people who call us for help are often at their wits end. They may have gone through an assessment process already and they may feel out of their depth. They are possibly having to consider commencing an appeals process and this can be simply too much for some who are already dealing with the loved one or someone that they know who has ill health. I have known families decide that they are going to use all of their loved one's capital to pay for care fees, irrespective as to whether the outcome was wrong or not, simply because they don't have the ability to challenge this. This decision is not a good one, but in our experience, it is made simply because they have no fight left to pursue the matter any further. For this reason, we would strongly recommend that families, attorneys and deputies seek advice in the early care funding process. This advice might be internet based, or I know of some charities such as Age UK who do offer telephone support. Alternatively, you might want to contact a care advocate such as myself. Assistance at the outset might be minimal, but the family may, for example, want practical assistance such as choosing a care home. If the needs of their loved one starts to increase though, it would be wise to seek advice to ensure that everything that should be done is being done to support that person in need of care. This will ultimately give you the best chance of obtaining NHS support and potential funding at the earliest possible opportunity. Advice can also be sought as to whether a retrospective application for NHS continuing healthcare funding might be applicable for those who have never been assessed during a period when they may have actually been entitled. A retrospective application can be made irrespective as to whether the person who has paid for their care is still alive or even if they have passed away. This is particularly pertinent point for anyone who might be appointed as an executor, because following this appointment, if you become aware that the deceased has never been considered for NHS continuing healthcare funding, it might be something you would then want to consider. And equally, as you are a beneficiary, this may be something you would like to raise with the executor before the estate is finalised, given that it may be of benefit to you. Seeking advice at any stage will not only enable the family to ensure that the correct decisions are made financially, but will provide a means of support and guidance through what can be a very difficult and challenging time. Finally, although Leah has already discussed lasting powers of attorney, I just wanted to add a little food for thought on how important the health and welfare lasting power of attorney can be. I know that a lot of people decide not to bother getting the health and welfare lasting power of attorney as they feel that firstly the property and finance LPA is the most important and secondly it is assumed that the next of kin will be entitled to contribute to any health and welfare related issues. 
sadly this isn't right. Please understand that while some professionals will invite you to participate in meetings, they do not have to do so. After all, there could be a reason why the person in need of care decided not to appoint a health and welfare attorney. When we request copies of medical records and notes to prepare for meetings such as NHS continuing healthcare eligibility, we often have a battle on our hands to obtain these medical records if there is no active lasting power of attorney for health and welfare. I've lost count of the number of battles I've had with GP surgeries, hospitals and care homes about this point. Furthermore, there can be meetings to discuss health issues. And although you may be invited to attend those meetings without a health and welfare LPA, any wishes or preferences you may have had may not hold any weight, given that those acting in professional capacities are obliged to act in the best interests of the individual who has lost capacity, irrespective of the fact that that decision being reached may not be what the family would prefer. In the circumstances, please do not dismiss health and welfare LPAs. They are more important more recently and they are becoming more important as people are becoming more obstructive. If you would like to be in a position to fully advocate on behalf of your loved one in the future, we feel that this is the best option available to you. Thank you. So if I just hand back to Taryn, I don't know where, if anybody's got sort of any questions about all of that. It's very hard to condense it all to 30 minutes, as I'm sure Leah appreciates. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steph. Um, we don't have any questions in the Q&A at the moment, but I have been sent some over email earlier. Um, so if I can ask you both of these in the meantime, the first question says, my dad's care fees are being paid for by the local authority due to his limited assets. Is there any point in an NHS continuing healthcare assessment taking place as his care fees are being funded already? Yeah, so that's a good question. So ultimately, because obviously um, he is currently having his income used to pay towards his care fees from his pension and, and any income that he's got available to him, what people don't realise is that there is a potential contribution, even if he's not seeing sort of any uh, loss from that. So we would always recommend that they get CHC um, applications in simply because if he is entitled, then he will preserve that income as opposed to using it to pay towards his care fees. Thank you. Um, and we've also been emailed um, from someone on the call saying you have suggested that it is important for detailed records to be kept by the care home for the purpose of an assessment. But what should I do if I already know the records being kept aren't that great? Yeah, so in the first instance, I'd recommend that they speak with the care home manager um, because obviously if they can try and uh, reach an agreement with the home about the record keeping, it's always the best. Um, if they do get any problems, then they can come to somebody like ourselves. We can work with homes. Um, we have worked with homes previously on cases um, where the records aren't up to scratch because essentially it means that that person could be deprived of funding that they might be entitled to. I, I have a question for you, Stephanie, if that's OK. Yeah, no problem. Uh, when you spoke about um, retrospective applications, is there any time limits on such applications? So at the minute, there is a deadline. Um, the Department of Health have put in um, a deadline. And at the moment, you can go back to 2013 um, with regards to retrospective applications. But there hasn't been anything further coming since. OK. So that's quite a long time. So if people are dealing with estates or yeah. uh, just recently taken over family members' um, finances, that they, something they could consider from a historic perspective. Yeah, and sometimes what can happen is if there is um, a um, obviously an attorney in position when the person's alive and then suddenly they've not done anything, it might transpire for the executor that there's more needs to be done um, when they essentially then take over that responsibility because the patient sort of passes away. Yeah, that's really good to know. Thank you. And we will provide the opportunity, as mentioned at the start of the webinar, if anyone wants to join us live, raise your hand now um, and you can come and unmute and join us if you would like to. I think everybody's shy this evening, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Ready for the weekend. Yes, yeah. 
Okay, it doesn't look like we have um, anyone who wants to join us and that's absolutely fine. What we'll do is we'll pop you all out an email if there is anything that you'd like to follow up separately with Stephanie and Leah, who are both very happy to answer any other questions you might have off of the webinar. Um, but that it will be us now. We'll let you get back to your evenings. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Leah, as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for attending.